going to talk to some, some people on the ground about what they're doing with their campaigns and whether uh, data versus brand versus uh, actually talking humanely to people that with interesting messages, what the market is actually doing with the data or without it. We're going to start with um, Adam Ferrier. Now, well, I should say that we have two. We have sort of, you've got a little bit of PwC in you, don't you, Adam? Just a tiny bit. Yeah, a and you've got a bit of Accenture. So, and then we've got a holding a company. Bit. So we are completely democratic here across the, the, the industry. Um, Adam, the first thing to kick off with is you're slightly unconvinced about this whole data move for the effectiveness in communications and planning. You, I think one of, the, one of the comments you said to me last week was there's so much shit you can do, uh, but not necessarily it's, you know, there's not good shit. Now, you, you have um, this perspective that data and brand, we are, there's a disconnect there. Just talk, talk a little bit through that when you're doing your work. Um, sure. So I think um, uh, brands have always been built on what we're good at doing and what the consumer wants and trying to marry those two things together. Um, at the moment, there seems to be lots and lots of feedback loops and data around what the consumer wants, and it feels like, to me, a lot of the time is we're paying a lot of attention to that, to what the consumer wants, whilst forgetting what it is our brand actually stands for and what we can deliver. And I agree with what uh, Mark said previously. In Australia, I don't think we're particularly good at speaking or understanding the language of brand. We're really good at understanding the language of product and product innovation but the sensitivities to really understand what is a brand and how a brand grows, um, I think uh, are, start, are lacking and also getting hoodwinked by consumer data where we can measure every single breath they take and every single uh, time they go to the toilet, and everything we can measure, everything we want about them, but we're, we're less good at really understanding our brand, what it stands for, and how that can uh, be built over time. And just on also on the, um, that kind of conversation around uh, which, uh, Ritson and Galloway were talking about before around monopolies versus brand-driven times. I don't. Th I think it's always been thus. I think it's always been a really good brand becomes so differentiated that it does create a category of one. And I can remember right back in the day, Swatch watches were the first watch that became kind of fashionable and high-end, and they kind of had a monopoly, and that was used as a case study. So I think it's always been good for brands to try to strive to create a monopoly in the consumer's mind. I think through technology now there's lots more opportunities to do that. But that doesn't mean it's the death of uh, brand. It just means that's like the holy grail of brand is to create the category. But just elaborate a little more on this, this notion that you talk about of, uh, you know, good insight um, doesn't come from, well, good stuff, good work doesn't come from necessarily from consumer insight. No. Which the, the whole industry is going that way at a thousand miles an hour. That's right. Everyone's talking about being customer obsessed and consumer obsessed and it's, it's, it's really is, I think it's bullshit and I think, it's, I think it is trying to pretend we're good corporate citizens putting the consumer's interests at heart above in anything else, which isn't a good business model because for most people, if they put the consumer's interests at heart, their brand probably wouldn't be there in the first place. Um, and so the, the, what you want to put at heart at the very, very core of your business is your brand and building a brand that consumers then want. But I think it's understanding what your brand stands for and putting that above and beyond anything else. So an example of that, and this is what we're, where we're trying to get to is the, the conceptual on the data inputs versus actually what happens, what you guys are doing on the street. Um, Vegemite is an example of where you said, um, you know, there was no consumer insight. We weren't listening to the if consumers. We, if we did consumer insight today, if we invented Vegemite today and went and did some focus groups and did some sensory testing, I guarantee you, it would be Vegemite would not exist. It would be <laughs> look and <laughs> talked about as shit. Right? Yeah, well, it, I don't think it would. I don't think Vegemite would pass focus groups and sensory testing today. And I think it's a really interesting example. But, and what about some of the work you're doing for Vegemite as well? Did you, you know, you, your, your Ashes stuff, your sort of tactical stuff, Mark's got a view on that, but, you know, the, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, Are you ready for that, Mr. Um, Consumer Psychologist? Well, when, uh, with the Vegemite work, which is, so we've only been, got, we've, and the Vegemite stuff was we we're really proud of. When we did the first bit of work, which tastes like Australia, uh, we had Pauline Hanson starting the advertising um, saying how to explain how to make Vegemite and, um, and we were worried about it, the, the client was worried about it and we wanted, wanted to try to understand if it would work or not. Um, but we didn't do pre-testing but what we did is we just did a structured questionnaire to a whole bunch of marketing scientists and sent out a structured questionnaire on various aspects of the campaign and asked them what they thought and they all thought um, yeah it made sense for a whole lot of different reasons and they gave us their reasons and we kind of 
put all those together and um and there we and then we kind of um came up with it so we, and we did it and so it wasn't about being, about being brave i don't think i think if, if you try have to be brave i think you're probably just not as informed as you could be and then if you're informed then it's not about being brave, it's just doing the right thing to build the brand. Mark Green, so you, you're now part of Accenture, which is, um, you could say, was, is technology and data-led. You've been a creative hotshot for a long time. Um, f- what happens now? Are you, how are you reconciling those, those, those two, those two um, different cultures and what's happening with your work? Let's, and let's also reference meat, meat Livestock and the lamb stuff, right? Because that's probably where we're talking about data and inputs. You've gone off script there. Yeah, look, I, I think there's a lot in that question, Paul. But, Thank you. Uh, there's, uh, I th- I th- let's start with um, the monkeys and Accenture. Um, I think Accenture were getting closer to the customer through the technology and websites and platforms that they were building. And uh, the natural kind of, uh, I guess, evolution of that was to get closer to the brand and creativity. And the combination of the monkeys and Accenture brings creativity and technology together. And I think that is the world we live in, so it makes sense. And it's kind of the the view of an end-to-end service for our clients. And it recognises that uh, you need both. You need both to be successful. Um, You know, we're we're, we're firm believers in uh, building brands and and long-term brand building, uh, using creativity to ignite the funnel and drive sales. We've seen it with pretty much all of our clients where we have great long-term platform ideas for brands uh, they are more successful than those that just I'd, I'd use think, tactical I'd, tactical I'd, activities to kind of, you know, try and build short-term sales. I didn't uh, hear the question. Tell us the benefits of Accenture and the monkeys coming together. Hey, what's that? <laughs> sorry, I'm just taking... Uh, sorry, I was trying to take the piss out of Mark a little bit. Sorry. We've, we've got a long history of... Uh, yeah, there's love on the stage right uh, here. By the really list. glad to be sat in <laughs> Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Basically disagreeing <laughs> with every point that we each other make. A- as you fun. should, because if you didn't, then it would be boring up here too. But the yeah. chip that you've had from Accenture, yeah. the, the data chip, how are you coping with that and what is changing about how you, oper- how you operate and, the, and your output, the work? Oh, look, I, I don't think anything has changed um, too much because I think you use all sorts of insights to inform what you do in marketing and some of them you pay more attention to than others. And look, I, I think you know, great creativity can come from any sort of insight or idea or inspiration. You know, I think what we do well is we steal from everywhere. You know, we steal from culture, we steal from kind of product insights or data insights or consumer insights or whatever it might be to try and create interesting work. Um, you know, if you go back to one of our old campaigns, Oak, Kill Hungry, Thirsty, Dead, it was actually a dude in a focus group that said, you know, you drink Oak when you're either hungry or thirsty or a bit of both. We took that and created a campaign which has been running for 10 years. Um, you know, uh, to MLA, which is really just borrowing from what's happening in society, like what are the cultural tensions in Australia. Last year, it was patently obvious that New Zealand were doing a better job at managing their country than ours, and we couldn't hold on to a prime minister whilst Jacinda Ardern was becoming this uh, you know, legend globally for a modern kind of outlook on social and economic policy. Um, we borrowed that and created, uh, you know, we suggested that Australia and New Zealand merge and form, uh, uh, form New Australia land, and you know, the campaign was hugely successful. It had about three or four hundred thousand dollars in paid media. The rest was earned, and you know, over ten million people kind of either shared it or saw it or got involved in the commentary around it. And that's a great use of kind of modern technology to, you know, make the most of creativity and what's happening in society to just drive engagement. But all would it be fair to say? Ask us what the production budget was. Yeah. What what was the the production budget? The the production budget is about six hundred. And the media budget's probably about three or four hundred thousand dollars. And there's a bit of a PR kind of strategy every year. And in each campaign, there's a few Easter eggs to, you know, set off the kind of right wing and left wing um, uh, militants uh, to, right. sort of, you know, generate a bit of conversation on both sides of the fence. Um, but it's, you know, over, you know, we've been doing it for about six or seven years. Every single time we've done it, we've invested in creativity to ignite kind of sales and. It is a long-term effective campaign for MLA. So apart from the MLA and some of the other work that you're doing, on balance, would we, would we as a panel think that the, that the level of engagement that, that the industry is putting to the people 
has has lowered because of the the clinical data inputs that are going on? Is it, is it changed? Uh, the way you get decent work that engages up. And I think maybe I'll go to Caitlin because you're of the view that a lot of this, there's a, there's a real blandness across brands now because they're playing safe. They don't want to get, they don't want fallout. Um, they don't want to upset anybody. What's going on there? Yeah, I mean, so I'm obviously in between companies at the moment, but what I am doing is teaching at UTS. And two of the campaigns I've taken the students who recently were actually Vegemite and MLA. And Vegemite, they love the campaign because it feels like there is a consumer insight behind it, which is why I was so interested when Adam originally said, you know, it's about building a brand, not necessarily finding that consumer insight. Because, you know, my partner's Australian, we saw those ads, my dad started, you know, piling in, talking about the palms. It, it feels like that was based on something that's really true to a lot of people. So, yes, they care about whether Vegemite or Marmite tastes better, but they also just really like to go at the ashes. Um, they also love some of the MLA ads because they say something that's a bit challenging. And we took them through the Boat People ad and lots of you know, the students hadn't seen either of these ads before on telly because they don't watch a lot of free to air, they tend to watch you know, YouTube, they find all of their news through social. But both those campaigns sparked an interest that I don't think I can get from them by showing them many of the other campaigns that are currently live. I think there has been such a fear of you know, upsetting people that we are just really operating a lot of the time in the safe middle ground. And that doesn't fit with what people are looking at outside of advertising. I think we're really guilty in our industry of putting one ad next to another and comparing them. And actually, that's not how consumers view adverts at all. They view it in between, looking at pretty extreme content on Twitter, on Facebook, the kind of content that they're looking at is really, really right or left. It's people taking a massive stand. It's, you know, the Scots of the world who are not afraid to say, this is heroin, this is, you know. And to then put an ad that's quite nice, mm. that looks quite safe, that makes me feel a little bit sentimental, is not going to cut through and drive massive brand value. And so good, why are we there, point. though? Sure. Good point. There was a, I think there's a famous quote from an old... Uh, um, advertising guy from San Francisco called Howard Gossage, and he says that, you know, people read what's interesting to them, sometimes it's an ad. And I think, you know, we've got to remember that we are mostly kind of uh, interrupting people's entertainment and asking them to pay, pay a bit of attention to a brand message. Like, we, we owe the audience for that to be interesting, entertaining, provocative, uh, or, you know, it's, it's, it's not as dull. And I think in today's environment, technology means that you actually have to do that because otherwise they can skip your ad. They can ignore it. I mean, I don't know, like, how much time do you actually see seeing ads unless they're shared on the internet or, uh, you know, they're interesting enough to get your attention. So I think actually technology has meant that it's not just a good thing to be creative, it's actually essential to get heard and understood. But the forces of personalization, Adam, the forces of personalization, the technologists will argue that is the cut through that are, or is, is sort of a proxy for some of the engaging work you do, that personalization will get to with the data underneath it, that that's what we need to do, the right person, right time, right place, right product, right message, rah, rah, rah. That's, this is the problem. We've got this sort of blandness as a result. Yeah, I think um, uh, a friend of ours, Faris, um, I think he, he explained that scene in Minority Report where all the ads are talking right. are talking <laughs> to the person. Everyone, uh, everyone in advertising thought, wow, isn't that fucking cool? And everyone outside of advertising thought, oh my God, isn't that hideous? <laughs> yeah. I, don't think there's, I, don't, I don't think there's any research that says being, uh, having personalised messages is necessarily more effective than not personalising um, Stuff I'm not sure. Well, I have seen a bit. There is a um, bit, yeah, depending. There's but um, but I think you know there's been enough uh, evidence, I guess, about it's constantly trying to get new users into the category, and it's the users that we don't necessarily know, or who are the light users of the category who don't necessarily have the data on. They're the ones who we kind of need to keep on bringing into the category. Mm. Um, and again, the more we listen to consumers, the more likely we are to be listening to the consumers who are closely around us. And so we start to then optimise our messages around those. And I think as well, one of the reasons why there's so much boring stuff out there is that most people don't necessarily need your brand. They need the category your brand exists in. And so if you take, for example, tertiary education, if you do a bunch of focus groups or you ask a whole lot of people what they want from tertiary education, they'll say, I just want to get a job at the end of it. 
And so you see a lot of kind of advertising and tertiary communications talking about being the best you can be and get a job and, and kind of all kind of mimicking the kind of a core category driver. Whereas so much about, for example, this is just an example, so much about universities, about self-exploration, being inspired, about sharing ideas about, and all of, that kind of, all of that kind of shit. But they're all kind of secondary or third drivers. But because the research says you have to go for the key category driver, you got, which is what consumers say, you got a lot of people then trying to clamour into the same space Pack, right. as opposed to what their brand particularly stands for. So, um, and so the brand gets sacrificed as, as the consumer insight becomes increasingly important. So with the Vegemite stuff, just for what it's worth, that insight came from us speaking. We wanted to understand about taste and how, some, how a whole country could like the taste of, a straight, of Vegemite. So we went to speak to a cultural taste expert at Melbourne University and this person started talking about um, how there's... Uh, anyway, he started talking about taste being a cultural construction and therefore Australians have created the taste of Australia, of Vegemite, and that's where the whole insight came from. Once we understood that, and once Vegemite was bought by an Australian company, then we could have a tagline like, Taste Like Australia, and therefore that liberated us to take, take the piss out of Marmite in the ashes because it was just reinforcing what the brand stands for. Hmm. It wasn't necessarily driven driven from what the consumer But it's needs. where a consumer and a brand insight align, which is kind of what you want. Yeah, it is. But, but the question the is why not? Is came, came from the, what the brand stood for yeah. in that particular instance. And I think that's the issue. Sorry, Paul. No, you can talk. With focus groups, it's really, really difficult to get people to say what they want, not because they're being difficult, but because we don't know what we want. Oh. But also, they don't care. Yeah. Like, like yeah. they don't care about your brand. They and that you know they don't care what a particular university wants to say. So they'll just say whatever they need to say to get through that thing. They just yeah. It just reminds me. I used to work for this entertainment company, and I remember you'd ask them, you know, what is it you like to watch? And everyone would come back and say, you know, the really high-end docos. They're what my family and I sit down to every nine o'clock. And you look at the actual data, and it's mm. like Simpsons reruns, Friends reruns. And it's not that they're lying. That's what they would like to be watching. But it's not what they're actually watching. Well, it's the, it's the old argument, isn't it? With, you know, Henry Ford, if you ask them what they want, faster horses, they didn't know they wanted a car. And if you want, when you want, when yeah. you want a phone, they didn't know they wanted a smartphone that Jobs came up with. You, they can't tell you that. But what I'm interested in is why, if this is the case, and to your point about category um, pack mentality by, by marketing and brands, why doesn't it change? What's going on in the in the institution on the on the enterprise side, the client side that says hey, we get that that makes sense. Let's do something different. What what do you get, Mark? We'll go yeah. from Mark. Well, I, I, look, I, I think there just hasn't been enough uh, evidence around um, the impact of long term brand building up until more recent times, and now it is actually you know well documented that if you spend around you know emotionally charged brand building activity works. It works much more effectively than tac short term tactical um, activities. So I think there's the tipping point where you, you suddenly you've got the data and evidence in favor of uh, building brand, using emotion, great creativity to sort of ignite sales. And I think that combination of uh, evidence, uh, you know, it doesn't say that short term tactical sales don't have their place. I mean, the it's saying 60, 40 of your marketing spend should be spent brand to um, short term tactical sales. And I think that is starting to get traction. So a lot of our clients are now starting to um, reinvest in brand, recognize that, um, you know, that's that's the weapon uh, that will kind of make the difference. And, um, you know, I, I think that is a story that most clients are beginning to understand. That's going to play out in what time frame do you think? Is that a, sort of in the next 12 to 18 months you'll, you'll see more yeah, of that? Yeah, look, I, I, th I think there's more and more marketers that have that uh, kind of education and are starting to employ it. Like, you know, IAG, Brent Smart, you know, Telstra. Um, and interesting, Telstra is a good example of where it was actually uh, the marketing mix modelling that kind of highlighted the impact of brand and told them to invest more in brand versus the thousands of tactical campaigns they were doing, flogging prepaid mobile plans or handsets. So, like, uh, And that's I, a live dashboard, and it's sort of it's moving based on yeah, how many, how many is, promotional messages from Telstra in the market. If it's yeah. too much, they flip to brand. That's the, the Accenture monkeys yeah. tie up. Is that an ad? Is that yeah. a plug for you? Yeah, look, I, I, th I think it is, but I, but I think it just makes sense, right? Like, I mean, 
we're all consumers. We all know what kind of uh, gets our attention, how we how advertising can actually work when it's uh, you know spot on in terms of brand message, but also the work that is created. And you know if you recall reflect back to Carlton Draft when they did the big ad and the ad with the canoe, you know suddenly we're all drinking Carlton Draft and it was back as one of the leading um, kind of sellers in CUB. Um, it has fallen off the radar. Its advertising is far worse than what it ever was. And it's no, there's no, there's no kind of, uh, I guess, uh, I mean, that's because the brand lost its way. So, Caitlin, there's aware, Mark tells there's awareness and willingness uh, on, on, amongst marketers to change it up. Uh, do you, what are the conversations you're having with, on your clients? What are they talking about? And is the ability of the marketer to actually push that through the organisation to show a result, a return, is that, is that, a, is that a hurdle? Yeah, uh, I mean, I kind of respectfully disagree because I've worked with Brent and he is, you know, a fantastic outlier, to be honest, in that he is willing to go for long term. He has another person who looks after the math side and he wants to look after the magic and they work very well together. But I think in companies that don't necessarily have a CMO who is that outspoken, you do end up with people still chasing short-termism because their average tenure is still really low. And especially if you go for small it's companies. What, two, two and a half years is the average tenure yeah. of a CMO. Yeah. So if Three you, times less than the CFO, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So if you're going for a smaller company that maybe doesn't have the heritage, doesn't have the proof of, well, it worked before we went to short-termism, you're going to really struggle. I, I kind of came into this industry when the switch was happening and everyone said, let's do digital, let's put all our money in last click attribution, let's just chase people at the end and you know it's gonna make shareholders really happy, the ROI is gonna look great, and it does for two years. And then you just see everything else fall off a cliff. And I had a client who went from spending 80% of their budget in big TV sponsorships, Simpsons, X Factor, to doing exactly that. And that's what happened. They had to completely pivot their whole company. And we worked with them and said, look, your training in digital is not wrong, but you need to invest that in your technology and in your business. So instead yeah. they said, well, all right, we'll get half of our consumers buying through the app. That's an actual purpose that's going to drive value. It's going to drive customer experience. And we will use marketing for the job it should be doing, which is, to Adam's point, building the brand again. Adam, how, how widespread is that? That, that intent and um, receptivity to do that on client side, the conversations you're having, both your clients and broader market, where do you see the understanding of that and the ability to act on it? Um, uh, I think everyone's kind of, I think marketing sciences has done a shitload really, really quickly. It's been fascinating watching the last 10 years. It used to be absolutely, have, I used to have massive competitive advantage in the marketplace. Because of your long hair or something? No. By positioning myself in a marketing <laughs> science -y kind of way oh, right. and starting the, uh, that conference and so forth. But now everyone is talking about it and it's great because everyone kind of gets, gets the fundamentals of marketing in that regard. I think the last outpost now is holistic company-wide uh, brand understanding driven from the CEO, not the CMO and the entire organisation getting it. So that's a, that's a good point. So Silicon Valley doesn't get it, but they <laughs> yeah. lead with the product, and then they go, fuck, we need marketing. Although they're, they're even, even Silicon Valley in recent times, Facebook true. is starting, they've hired a former CMO of Pepsi, and they're trying to kind of oh, get... Totally, they're all trying to yeah. do it, but I think those, I think those jobs are struggling because product doesn't report into yeah. uh, the CMO. It's still on the side, still seen as promotional. And then you see the big, or the big kind of legacy industries are run often by CFOs or um, salespeople, and they and what you need is the C, you need the CEO to be the chief brand officer. And yeah. then if it's C, if it's, if a CEO gets it, then the whole organisation can build a, a holistic, single-minded brand story. But most and most CEOs in watching. Australia don't understand brand. No, and I think what's well, I think they're all starting to try, and I yeah. think as well, even the board is now starting to the board and the and the governance structure of a board is trying to understand brand and creativity as well, and I think that's where it gets really exciting if you can get the board to understand what brand building is about, and the CEO. And it used to be, it was really interesting. 10, 15 years ago, 
we had all these bullshit conversations around the CMO trying to understand the board and speak the language of a board, and they could all do these boring courses where they could go and understand the language of a board. I think they're starting to do those less now, and I think what you see is the board is now starting to understand, trying to go, oh, that brand stuff is interesting. There's lots of value in the brand. I think the board is <coughs> trying to understand what well, bridging, the bridging, uh, the idea would be bridging the two, I would have think. I well, that's thought, right. But, but well, no, no, I don't think so. Because I think <laughs> if one goes one way, it's just compromised. Like, I think traditional business building, in some ways, there's a compromise there of, of branding or a perceived compromise. Mm -hmm. But if you can have a pure marketer driving the business, i.e., uh, uh, Richard Branson, Steve Jobs, or whatever. If a pure marketer can drive a business, then there's then that business will will be, will be have value. I want to come back to Caitlin's point though around the, the the sort of the sense of not wanting to offend anyone. So now we, we, we're talking about the fact we're getting some traction around the need to keep building brand, but then you've got to have some messaging that sits behind it that actually is going to engage because you've got the conceptual notion of brand and performance. But then what you say is still, if you don't say it well, it's, gonna not, it's not going to work either. So this, this point you make about the, the, the lack of risk uh, and the appetite, the risk appetite to, do, to stand out, Caitlin, um, once you get the brand awareness thing happening inside an organisation, what about the ability to actually make some good, do some interesting things? Yeah, I mean, I, do, I agree with Adam on people don't care. Like, if you look at your own behaviour, you don't care that deeply about any of the products in your house, really. You might care, and I kind of disagree with Scott, you know, uh, I care about Uber because it enables me to go out late at night and not worry about getting home. That's made a fundamental... Should we try 1-3 cabs? Would be. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, that wouldn't be a client by any chance, were they? No. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's made a fundamental difference to my life, right? So I feel strongly about that brand, but most others I don't. So I think there is, yeah, a lack of appetite for risk, but more importantly, I think there's just such an echo chamber effect. And we, I think, have become really bad at seeking out discordant views. And that comes from lack of diversity in our existing companies. And obviously, I am no you know, better for that. I'm a Brit who works in Australia, mostly with like, lots of people that look a lot like me. I think we fail to get different ideas. I think that's why things like the Gillette ad happen, the Pepsi ad happen, because you don't have enough people actually stress testing and saying, no, this is not going to work. You've gone too safe. Um, but I also think it's we also, don't... It's also a skill, though. Like It's a real I skill. I mean, to... like. Yeah. I, th I think what you see with Gillette and Pepsi is just um, bad execution and you know, <coughs> bad quality. And I, I think um, the Pepsi work was done in-house. And yeah. uh, like I, I think there's, there's not a, a wealth of great agencies that are putting out good work. But I also think there's a power play where people are scared often. The junior people in those organisations who could have said to you, really doesn't look great to have Kendall Jenner doing this mm. civil rights white saviour thing, yeah. aren't allowed into those boardrooms and aren't the ones having the conversation. Whereas again, I'm sorry, I'm obsessed with Vegemite and Marmite at the moment, but when I showed the, the students this Marmite ad, and I don't know how many people have seen it, it was an ad in the UK, it was very, very contentious because it's about rescuing Marmite from houses where it's been left at the back of a cupboard. And they imitate kind of the RSPCA or child protection and they go in and they put it in this little case and it's really shocking. My sister works in child protection and I remember when we saw it together, she was like, oh my God, they cannot have got that through. And I remember people were crying, they were up in arms, but it was the only thing I showed these students in the last 10 weeks that they were like, that's an ad, that's an ad that I would be proud to make. And I don't think we're seeing enough of them in Australia and I think that's really worrying in a place where Woolies and Coles are going to be eclipsed by Aldi soon. You can't rely on having been a big brand in the past. You have to act differently. And I think that that comes from not understanding what customers want from a product point of view, because I agree with Adam, they're not always going to be totally upfront about that. Mm. But they know what they want from entertainment, and we're all in the business of entertainment. So We, we are actually seeing uh, probably more world-renowned, successful creative campaigns coming out of Australia than in any other decade. Really? So Yeah, so, so, so if, if you look at our performance in um, kind of, you know, on the global advertising awards in Cannes, etc., yeah. you know, Dumb Ways to Die, Graham, 
etc. We've probably um, had some of our greatest successes ever. Uh, for every so Harvey I, Norman, I, I, what's that? A, yeah, for every Harvey, we've got a lot of we've got a lot of shit yeah. advertising. But every every, every, every market does. A lot of does, really yeah. good advertising as well. Yeah. But That's I think right. it's yeah. a worry that a lot of that's a not for profit, right? Where the risk is. People are willing to take a bigger risk because they don't have the same marketing budget. Yeah, I'd agree that um, there's, uh, yeah, look, I think big brands doing great work. Um, there's probably less evidence of that. Um, but, I, but, you know, look, I, I think I'm always optimistic about um, uh, creativity and its ability to be impactful and for clients to buy it. Like, it's, it's a skill to get... Um, that work to market. It's a skill mm. in defining the brand. It's a skill in actually coming up with the idea and then executing it flawlessly for people to kind of go, holy shit, have you seen that MLA ad or, you know, Burley ad or Vegemite ad? But Adam, you, you say um, data's usurped uh, the conversation and I guess it still comes back to um, this notion that it's a lot, it's, it's, it's still a little bit dodgy to talk brand and the fuzzy soft stuff when you've got some hard data metrics and you can start showing things and there's still a... I'll give a you a really good there. example related to this industry. Uh, I, last night on Media Watch I was saying that journalists are being uh, rewarded for articles that get clicks as opposed to articles that don't get clicks. And well, so I think it's even subscriptions now, aren't they? They're flowing through to subscriptions. Yeah, that's right, uh, for, for subscriptions. So that's fantastic, that's fine, have no issue with that. What then becomes the issue is it then becomes about getting responses from the consumer driving how that particular journalist is going to write that particular mm. article, mm. as opposed to that particular journalist coming from a brand perspective. So if a brand that that particular journalist worked for had a point of view and a strongly held point of view, then that journalist would have to write the article according to that brand's perspective, as opposed to what the consumer wants or is going to click on. So. If the journalist can write from a brand's perspective, um, so if you had a news brand for, had, had a really strong point of view, this is my news brand, this is what I believe in, and then every journalist wrote to reflect that, that view, that brand will become stronger and stronger over time. If that journalist writes from the view of what will get me more clicks or more subscribers, then they're just going to be thinking about the consumer, which is going to make this brand become more homogenised. Uh, that arguably, makes sense. Hollywood has become that. The Hollywood's exactly all, all, all that. Those, so, uh, so all those yeah. old films that are becoming sequels, etc. It's you know research yeah. and and what they're they're listening to that rather than. And the more data you get, the harder it is. And if your brand has audience as its data, as its thing, then it becomes even harder to hold on. So media brands in particular, whether they be news brands or entertainment brands or whatever, find it really hard to build a brand because they're constantly getting feedback from the consumer all the time. So therefore, they take their eye off what they stand for and start trying to appease the consumer. So though on, a, on a positive on uh, technology and um, I, th I think platforms, et cetera, that we were, we were getting bashed earlier, like if you think about TV, um, you know, the abundance of choices for streaming, et cetera, has probably created a golden age in television. Um, some of the series that we're seeing um, across the board from Netflix to um, Prime, etc., and the battle for content and great content um, is really a, 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 a consequence of you know a desire from consumers to get that. So I, I think for every kind of uh, it is know, a positive. Yeah, for every problem, there's also some great creativity that's been unleashed. Yeah, but one of the things Scott says also with that abundance of technology comes massive anxiety epidemics like we are really creating too much choice for an awful lot of people just from streaming right there's so yeah. many different providers there's so many things you could should would be watching that most consumers particularly ones who have other things in their life like kids like a demanding job that they don't get home from till 10 o'clock that's kind of why they want to veg out right? mm. and i think sometimes this move for brand purpose and emotional advertising gets understood as it has to be a three-minute movie and it has to be something that makes me cry. Whereas we know emotional advertising, as long as it invokes an emotion, whether it's humour or yeah, joy, or what, yeah. it doesn't always have to be slow music and long shots. So your prospects, we've got a couple of minutes winding up. Um, the prospects, the next 12 to 18 months in terms of getting not just the brand uh, awareness uh, role, the role of brand building uh, happening, 
the quality of the message or the, 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 the depth of engagement with these messages, do we have any hope or is it more of the same? Re realistically, don't give me your, um, yeah, I believe. It's what's <laughs> going to happen in the market. Mark Green. Well, we're producing some of the best work we've ever produced and it's coming out over the next six months, so I'm very optimistic that the tide is turning and clients are wanting to uh, be braver and do more interesting work. And for those clients are what? I've had a uh, sniff at some I've, of the things that's coming, that's yeah. coming out and it's unreal. Yeah, well, so there's some, there's some really cool stuff. Like it's, and it's not just one client with, I think, stuff for NRMA, CGU, uh, even uh, the, sort of Telstra, uh, Qantas. Why well, are you uh, apologising for Telstra there? No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I, I just, it's a, no, I'm not at all. Um, <laughs> well, you went like this, Telstra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Telstra. Yeah. yeah, anyway. Uh, so, like, a lot of clients that are, we're doing... It's uh, broad, it's I think broad. There's, there's almost like a, um, a competitiveness amongst the client set that we're working with to do better work than the next client. But and there's I, I a rivalry is starting to kind of... Well, that's great, and yeah, I hope... Uh, I really, yeah. I mean, we'll come down and kick you in the ass. if ten, it doesn't Ten years it. ago, the current Lion started awarding the marketer of a year and I think that has, that has kind of rifled through everything where marketers are now wanting to do really, really good work and you're getting celebrity CMOs and I think those celebrity CMOs are being equated with brand growth around the world and it's unreal because then everyone's starting to want to do really, really uh, good brand driven stuff. Well, great, really promising. Caitlin, you're, 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 think, you're thinking the next 12 to 18 Yeah, months? I mean, I'm an eternal optimist and I've just taken a new job. So I'm in that moment yeah, right. where I haven't even <laughs> had to have any of the reawakening yet. But yeah, we've got great clients. You've got Maccas, you've got Westpac, you've got you know, Virgin. There's plenty of scope to do great work. And my MO is how do you use digital or technology to actually give people something they want? that is useful for them, that's entertaining. So that's that's where my focus is going to be, and I feel like we've got the ability at Tribal to work with clients who, as Mark says, want the same thing. That's yeah. second half glass full. What are you going to do? <laughs> I, 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 think I've just, I think I've kind of said what I think in terms of just that stuff. But can't digital work in terms of law involvement processing as well? So can't yeah. you just whack people over the head repeatedly yeah. with digital? Can and shouldn't you? it be look like... I don't know, I thought, I've always there, thought there, there it is should be seen more like yeah. low involvement processing rather than trying to... I think it depends what it is, yeah. right? Like, within, and again, I'm not talking about an app, but within something on your phone, I think you can also take advantage of people being a bit more vulnerable, being in more of an intimate space. Your context, which is what I think matters for all advertising, is very different. You're going, again, up against messages of a personal nature. So I think you can operate in an interesting way. Yes, it kind of needs to be low involvement because we have very little time and we're ethereally scrolling. But I think that you can't do necessarily big, big brand stuff on a mobile phone that you would do on a TV. But Whopper you Detour do though, like I mean that's a great example. The Whopper Detour is an amazing you know, example. I mean, that's, yeah. a, that's a brand idea. Yeah. That, uh, was in, you know, use your mobile to kind of 100%. redeem uh, uh, coupons for cheaper burgers from right. the yeah, the I think competitor, you so. just need we've got to, to, we've got to wrap it up. I'm getting line. red flash lights, but the, I think the takeout here is that we may see some. There's some hope in the, for the next 12 months. That's not a bad thing. Uh, thank you, panelists. Put your hands together for them, and we'll go to the next one.